Last week, there was a number of posts talking about the future of healthcare, about the great revolution in computer-aided diagnosis and medical informatics. But everyone knows that an overnight success story is actually a story at least 25 years in the making. And in this case, it's a story of well over 60 years. This presentation, I want uh, everyone to watch, is by Dr. Larry Weed. It's online on YouTube, and in the 55 minutes, he discusses the future of healthcare. But this was recorded in 1971. Dr. Larry Weed tried to shine a light into the field of medicine over half a century ago and show us how sloppy, unscientific, and unartistic we actually were. Many of his observations went unheeded until now. He knew something was coming, and in this lecture, he talks about, quote, and now, when the computer people move in and the non-medical people move in, they can hardly believe what they see and there is a crisis of major proportions. What I would encourage you to do is to stop this podcast, open up uh, YouTube, type in Dr. Larry Weed, Internal Medicine, Grand Rounds, uh, and watch his original 45 or 54-minute lecture. Um, it was, was uploaded by Dr. Art Papier and Visual DX. They're a, a very innovative company in trying to uh, diagnose uh, and make computer-aided diagnostics. It's kind of a palantir for medicine. I definitely recommend you check out their website. But um, this lecture, I'll just play the, his closing uh, two-minute comments and then pull out a few of the quotations which I found uh, most memorable. It can be centrifuged and separated, put together and studied. But the reason we don't like to do it is because your faults are so obvious. Your mistakes are so obvious. The lack of purity of your approach is so obvious. You can't stand it. So you say, it's unimportant, or it's not scientific, or that's not why I came into medicine. We're cowards. It's perfectly clear that's what the problem is. Society is unreasonable. It's frustrating. It's irrational. The cell was, too. The centrifuge was, too. Those mitochondria were. They weren't pure pets. The only difference was, is they couldn't talk back, and we couldn't see it. And we didn't devise methods to see how badly off we were. All right, now let me make one closing remark about what this has all got to do with, um, with the art of medicine. Where is the art of medicine going to go with all this? If you, if you have lists and numbers, well, art is style, structure, form, discipline. It's Andrew Wyeth making Jamie Wyeth do the painting 50 times until it's right. Unbelievable discipline about technique. He made that boy tear up a painting 100 times. It's George Zell, if you ever watched him with that orchestra. The same passage, 30 times until it was perfect. And no violinist stood up and said, this is interfering with my art. Nor did Bach say, three beats in every measure? Oh, that interferes with my creativity. That's too, that's too, that's too like an old maid. No. Art is Hemingway, three weeks on a single paragraph. It's Bach recording in detail everything he did a couple hundred years ago so we can hear it today. It's not a scribble in the middle of the night. It's not saying, oh, I took good care of her, leaving absolutely no trail for us to ever find out whether you did or did not. We debase the word art itself when we call what we've been doing art. And it's not science. So we have to be extremely careful when we defend what we're doing. We don't reveal to others that we don't even, didn't even get out of a liberal arts education. As Stravinsky says, that art is nothing more than placing limits and working against them rigorously. And if you refuse to place them and try to work within them, but just flail out, you do not have art, you have chaos. And to a large extent, that's what we've had. Thank you very much. That's the excerpt. Online, you'll get the other 50 minutes of the presentation, just like to pull out a few quotations on a few different themes that were addressed. 
The first was on patient resilience and diagnostic error. He states, well, you realize, I'm sure, that the Lord and the chiropractors can get 85% of the people better. The only reason you run these fantastic hospitals is to get the other 10%. And the only reason you have a professor of medicine is to pick up the final 2%. On patient care, and specifically on patient-centered care, he had this idea that in the record, there should be a deliberate spot in the plan where you write what you told the patient. He said, you know, in no place in American records do we organize an approach to where we are going to tell the patient. Did you tell her that her hypertension was serious or not? Did you say you were going to study it? Why or why not? Now, of course, the interesting comment is that we still don't have a place for this in our record over half a century later. On discussing the fallibility of doctors, he states, the way that interns and residents and doctors work, if they worked perfectly, it would be one thing, or if they didn't work at all, it would be another. But they half work, and we half guess, and we half understand, and we half know. Uh, the, the problem with this is that um, we, it's hard for us to know how, when we're doing things correctly or when we're doing things incorrectly, which is uh, one of the big drivers of why uh, improving our records was so important. When commenting on the source-orientated medical record, which is sorting a paper chart with all the, ra the radiology images together, all the notes together, all the labs together, which is, by the way, the way we still, over half a century later, sort our records, he comments, why do you put the x-ray of the ear with the x-ray of the hip? What's the ear got to do with the hip? And why do you have all those ear cultures with those urine cultures? Is she urinating in her ear? Why are you doing that for? Uh, he instead proposes a problem-orientated medical record. On discussing medical data and medical thought, he says that this is not an idle discussion on technical bookkeeping details, but that the practice of medicine is the way you handle data and think about it. And the way you handle it determines the way you think. And so the structure of our data determines the quality of our output. And that is so hard for medicine to accept. He goes on to discuss the issue of physician memory, stating that you might say, why don't you call up the doctor and ask him? To which he would reply, well, that was two months ago. You can't be serious. You wouldn't tell a bank teller, do you remember Mr. Jones? He came in two weeks ago. How much money did he put on the shelf? If you received an answer, you would think that the bank teller was crazy. But in medicine, uh, as he says, we write discharge summaries three weeks later. We write preoperative notes after the operation. Someone may write all their notes for on progress notes Sunday morning. This is, he says, fiction, not science. In discussing quality in medicine, he states, if you can't audit a thing for quality, it means you don't have the means by which to produce quality. They're inextricably linked. And you can't evaluate what you're doing then it's a very serious possibility that you don't know what you're doing. On systems thinking, he states, when someone says, I take care of that patient, I'm her doctor, that's fraudulent. No one points at a Pontiac and says, I made that car. A system made the car. It's like Henry Ford saying, I personally am going to make an automobile for everyone in the population. I don't believe in systems and assembly lines. I'd rather buy a a personal touch on it. He would make an automobile for two or three people a year. The other 200 million would have none. And this is the basis for revolution. The medical record is the basis for a system. The record has to be. 
and he goes into the presentation discussing uh, something which is called problem-oriented medical record. The first part is a focus on something called the database, which is the collection of all the information about the patient and the problem. And the big issue is that the way we do this as physicians is we take a Sherlock Holmes approach, asking questions and then cutting to the next follow-up question, when instead he says we should take a much more systematic approach to collecting a comprehensive database which is standardized for all the patients. And uh, this would then ensure that we actually have evaluated all the potential questions which we should look at. And the rebuttal, of course, is that doctors don't have time to do this. And so his reply is you should get paramedical people to do so. And you can use computers to aid in branching logic questions. And you need to get the database and to get the same database every time. We know that the database we get for a patient is dependent on how many admissions we've had that day, how tired we are, whether it's the morning or the evening, uh, whether we like to talk to the patient or we don't. And these variables shouldn't impact a patient's care. He quotes his own study where they took a questionnaire with 32 questions and they got vital signs and they had paramedical personnel do this entire process. It took nine to 11 minutes. And when they compared the database that they got from the paramedical personnel, they found an additional 5.2 problems per patient that the doctors had missed. And some of those problems were quite serious. The second part of the uh, problem-oriented medical record is going on to the problem list. Now, the key thing is that he's interested in a problem list, which is not an impression list. He wants no ambiguity in what the problems are. He goes through an issue, for instance, where someone had written down, as we often are prone to do, query organic heart disease. And he said, well, what's the problem? And the person replied that they had a funny echocardiogram. And he said, well, you know, you don't want me to write funny echocardiogram down as the problem. But in fact, that's exactly what Dr. Weeds wants the person to write down, is that the cardiogram looks funny. Because now we know what the problem is. To suggest that the person query may have organic heart disease is to essentially make up BS. And as Dr. Weeds says, if that's the level at which you understand the problem, put it down that way. If that's the level in which your care is being given, there's nothing to be ashamed about. All you have to do is be honest. Which moves us then into the third part, which is the plan. And one of the key concepts was that no one should ever be able to write an order without coupling it to a problem. Again, this is such a crucial part when designing medical record systems in the electronic system. We still don't do this. Um, for instance, it's like walking into a room and throwing darts, he suggests, and someone that might ask, where the target? And the response is, well, wherever the dart lands. And he proposes we need to be much more thought out in our plans. It needs to have three components. The first is to uh, rule out what could be causing the problem and to investigate the problem and to have a stepwise approach to investigations. The second is to identify what the treatments will be based on the results of the investigation. And the third is to then finally tell the patient uh, what you found and what you're gonna do about it. And to document all three of these steps and to lay out all three of these steps. When we follow patients uh, in a clinic or in hospital, of course, we can use something such as a soap note structure, which I think most people are probably f familiar with. That's the where you write your subjective findings, your objective findings, your assessment, and then your plan, and you do that underneath each of the problems. And one of the key concepts that Dr. Weeds goes into is the fact that he says, now, what I'm saying is that a doctor has to be a guidance system. He's not an oracle that knows answers. And once he accepts the concepts of being a guidance system, then he knows that the data system is the basis for which all of his work must take place. We have a perception in medicine for centuries that it's the doctor which has the answer. Whereas even half a century ago, Dr. Weeds knew that the key role of the doctor is to really be the guidance system. 
to ensure that the database is collected properly, to ensure that the problems are identified, to ensure that the plan is in place, and then to watch the trajectory as the patient's condition unfolds, as the, it is investigated, and as the uh, condition unfolds to see where it goes, and helping to guide the, um, the patient and the medical record through the system. And of course, with the augmentation of uh, artificial intelligence, augmented care through computer systems, more and more of the actual medical diagnostics and more of the um, predictions as far as uh, what the patient likely has and what the best treatment options are, is going to be better done by the computer. And so by putting a physician into more of a role of a guidance system and ensuring that this is operating properly actually is a right metaphor to be using as he applied it in 1971. If you're interested, as I say, I highly encourage you to go watch this whole uh, lecture online. Uh, I wanted to thank again Dr. Art Papier and Visual DX for uploading it. You can find, I got a copy of the transcript uh, online and embedded at the bottom of the post, it highlighted a few of my favorite sentences from it. It's a little bit hard to read because it's a, a verbal lecture, which is now being transcribed into paragraphs, but it has, as I say, some of my favorite sentences picked out in, in bold. If you're interested, Dr. Larry Weeds also has uh, written several books, as well as there's a few other short YouTube videos with him online, and there'll be a documentary which is still in production on his life, career, and works.